and we're recording. Welcome everybody to Gen Y Jazz. I am at my Brooklyn apartment because of some travel, so apologies, you can probably see my reflection in the poster here. Uh, but John Coltrane, of course, is with us, so that's kind of fun. And anyway, this is my uh, personal creative project during COVID time to just pick the brains of my favorite musicians and learn their wisdom. And today I'm very excited to have the first guitar player on the show. And uh, he's also a composer and a band leader and an educator, right, James? You teach a little bit and, uh, and a student. And so we're going to talk about all these things. But James Zito, how the heck are you? Sean, thanks so much for having me here. It's a real pleasure to be on um, this little creative project that you put together. I think it's an, a, a great thing to do for the community, for all of us to get to know each other a little deeper level and, you know, have some great conversations. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. This is great. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and supporting. Um, well, thank you, so, man. yeah, so you, you mentioned a little bit about teaching. Currently, I'm at Michigan State University as a grad undergraduate assistantship where I'm teaching a couple classes and and as well as private students and just doing general TA work to help things go smoothly and it's given me a lot of great experience to be able to get in front of a class you know especially at the beginning of my assistantship I was actually in person before the pandemic hit and that was a incredible experience getting to create my own course syllabus and um, basically cater teaching. I was teaching the beginning jazz improv class for non-majors, two semesters of that, Excellent. which is in, which is really cool because there's so many different levels of um, talent coming into at Michigan State and there's some really high levels and then there's also more intermediate and beginner levels and it's finding a balance to really intermingle all those groups and and uh, account for all the different learning styles so it was a, it's a really cool thing that they've got going on over here and it's nice to um, introduce a lot of soon-to-be educators of, of music to jazz and like okay what are some really important aspects of jazz and improvisation and how can we in inform ourselves through listening and um, transcription and you know just having conversations about the music what what um, stands out to us, what makes us feel excited, what makes us feel sad. We just identify the different emotions. And um, and then we also talk about the theoretical side of, of music as well. It's really, I try to make it as well-rounded as possible while also speaking to their interests as far as communicating this as a teacher to your students. Dude, that's, that's excellent. I'm really uh, glad that you picked up there because that touches on so many things that um, that are interesting to me and and really are motivating this interview series you know I'm a teacher um, everyone I've interviewed so far is a teacher and there's an art to it that I'm learning and and that I think we're all learning right especially at our age and um, being you know members of the illustrious Gen Y I think we all have strong uh, opinions on jazz education and so to that effect you you mentioned a few things the first that I want to pick up on is emotion um, I studied with Stefan Harris and his whole concept is emotion as it relates to harmony and allowing harmony to tell the story and I wonder is that what you're getting at when you say you're you're um, focusing on emotion or are you focusing on emotion of recordings compositions licks what is it exactly that that drives that concept in your teaching i'm familiar with what you're speaking to about stefan and his whole um, ideology and i think that that's an incredible way of teaching harmony and how to understand and identify these sounds i personally didn't take that exact approach i more went in the direction of um talking it just you know treating the beginning jazz improvisation students as just normal musicians and asking them you know like not trying to alienate them like they're some brand new baby to this music it's like you still have musical inclinations you still have big ears and you're all very talented people that's why you're here so we i i start the playing field there and then once once we start listening i just want to hear their observations of you know like if i was to play something like john coltrane alabama 
mm-hmm. as opposed to Dizzy Gillespie, um, you know, Night in Tunisia. And we'll, we're talking about all the different textures and colors and um, like, you know, what what mood does this song encompass? Is this a somber mood? Is this sad? We have this whole palette of emotions and when we're improvising, we like to build up our toolbox, as I like to call it, with a lot of different um, devices and choices that we can make to manipulate those emotions in real time, wherever we want. And just being first, I think the first step is being able to identify those emotions through music when you're listening. Because I've always put listening is paramount. You have to listen, listen, listen. First class is a whole lecture on listening and the blues. That's right. like where we start off, nice. home base. We need to find what is like, what is this feeling that we're hearing in Bessie Smith? You know, we'll identify the fo- not necessarily. We won't start out talking even about form and and chord changes. We really are just focusing on how can we first of all hear something and understand really what the message behind it is, even if it's instrumental and not doesn't have lyrics. Or can we at least come to some sort of consensus or conclusion of, yeah, we all can pretty much say that, um, you know, John Coltrane's Alabama, even if you didn't know the story and what he was paying, tr- um, trying to bring light to and in, in what was going on in the world in that time, then you could still feel that there was something hurting, or that there was something disrupted that needs to be reckoned with personally and thought over and prayed about, you know, all those different really spiritual elements of music. And then we'll also listen to Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, you know, uh, <laughs> why can't we be friends? Like right. all that kind of stuff. We go right. into that old, not uh, not even that old, but um, their early recordings and the, the vibe that they get on those records and how there's this chemistry going on. You don't even see them, but you can tell they're smiling as they're right. singing these and they're look, probably looking at each other and all that kind of stuff. So it's really... I'm trying to show them all the different facets of and ranges of emotion that go into being an improviser because this is your palette. This is your, you have a canvas and you need to paint and you need to learn how to mix these colors together to find your personal flair and style. And it takes time. It takes a lot of deep, um, well, deep focused listening, purposeful listening, and just understanding the differences between, you know, when I'm listening for leisure and when I'm lis- listening to really understand. You know, like, because we can have a conversation and I can be on my phone on Facebook or Instagram and I'm hearing you, but I'm not really understanding and, and really taking the time to to just, you know, sit with what you're trying to say to me and, and comprehend it to the degree that you want me to. Or I can sit there and look you in the eyes and be completely focused and give you some sense of I'm here with you and I'm following you and I'm not just listening to respond but I'm listening to understand James you just taught me something <laughs> uh, about my own teaching I think you know I'm I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you uh, talk about those recordings and those artists and and your approach and your obvious passion for them uh, your obvious love of the music and I think I share that but when it comes to meeting with the student or the class and conveying that I tend to get inside you know my head as far as what I'm working on as a player and then I try to convey that to the student and suddenly the the passion and the emotion is it doesn't translate (laughs) because suddenly I got focused on the technical so the fact that you're just saying forget me let's check the masters and let's just imbue not imbue let's uh, imbibe what they what they represented emotionally speaking uh and i'm hearing a lot of rodney jones in that (laughs) which we're going to get to um and uh i just want to commend you for that because because as a teacher i think that's something i need to do better um and so good on you for that. And, and, you know, maybe I can now get a lesson from you at some point. And maybe today I can get a lesson from hey, you. Hey, man, time. I don't need any lessons. <laughs> you don't need any lesson from me. I need a lesson from you with your incredible playing. And your concept is just right on the money. So I'm just as much of a fan of, of you. And well, you said that you needed to work on, um, you know, separating the technical from the emotional in your teaching. I think I also still need to work on that, too. I'm trying to implement it as as 
vigorously as I possibly can and just make it as inclusive as possible. You know, right. when we're talking about artists, a lot of time we get stuck behind the recordings and we just understand the sound of the artists. Like, this is John Coltrane. This is his sound. This is Cannonball Adderley. This is Grant Green. This is James Brown, whoever it is. But, you know, we hear their recordings and that's what we associate with. You know, you, you know sometimes you, you have to... Um, see with your ears you know they I saw a quote recently it was like hear with your eyes and see with your ears and it was kind of I kind of pondered that for a minute I was like what does that even mean and now as I'm kind of talking about this I'm thinking you know we 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 see with our ears first with artists and especially in the recording in in these old records that we check out a lot of times we're just hearing them and we're getting an idea of who they are through their sound and what they're trying to convey to us with their artistry and I like to humanize the artists a lot more when I'm teaching about them. And and um, in my class, I use these different songs as tools because because there's composers that to each one of these songs, even if it's Blue Bossa, we're learning about Kenny Dorham. You right. know, there's somebody that we can attach to this. So it's always like a fully well-rounded way of approaching music because it's not just we're going to learn these songs. We're going to learn these musical phrases. We're going to learn um what these chord changes how to spell them and then that's it it's i want i really want people to try to connect with um you know deeper with each of these artists and try to see where they're coming from in their certain time periods like something i specifically do is um i'll be teaching about um an artist like let's say like my first week i do dipper mouth blues like I want people to learn about Louis Armstrong, so we check out this recording, Dipper Mouth Blues, and that's going to be their first transcription for the whole sem for the for the you know first unit, and it's it's really a guided transcription. We're working on it together, but before we even get into any of that, we're listening to um, a bunch of different recordings on the first day of just Louis Armstrong. So here's him in all these different contexts. Here's him singing. Here's him playing trumpet. Here's him doing duet. Here's you know his musical palette this is so you can get to know him and then the assignment for that week all right artist of the week is Louis Armstrong everybody check out some check out music from these records between now and Wednesday when we see each other again and we're gonna talk about it and then we're gonna also work on Dipper Mouth Blues and we're gonna sing we're gonna, singing is a really important part of um, imparting this knowledge to, to students because if you can sing it you can play it right and um, it, it connects people with their inner mu musical self. It's not just I'm inhibited by my ability on the instrument or whatever the instrument is because that's going to get in the way a lot quicker than your your voice will get in the way, you know, unless you're, you're tone deaf. And even so, you can still shed and work through it. And if you really want something, you can achieve it. Trust me. Anything is possible if you put your mind to it and, and you have that dedication and that drive because if you work on it every single day, even if it's 60 BPM, really slow, with a piano to guide your pitch, you know, then you're gonna you're gonna reap a lot of benefits from that. And um, so we'll sing rhythms together. We sing we talk about scatting, and do da dit dat. Those right. are just some basic ones to get you started, and really um, lean well to the type of phrases we're doing, like. Dit dit do da do da you know like you can hold those as opposed to like there's so, there's some other scat phrase scat um syllables that don't work really well on longer notes so I try to just start them because you can do da da dit dit do do da and all that and they can be short too but they work long well they work well long so I try to you know give my students these tools I, this is like the beginning of their toolkit right it's like now you've got some syllables now you've got some rhythms now you've got some context in the you know understanding the first artist that we're talking about and it kind of helped it kind of um, progresses through the timeline a little bit it does skip around a little you know just naturally from from when the compositions were written but we're still checking out different artists and different perspectives of, of jazz because it's difficult to just be like you're a beginning student so now I have to go to the natural canon of, um, okay, Blue Bossa, Autumn Leaves, maybe All the Things You Are if you're a little bit more advanced, but, you know, Sea Jam Blues. And it's not that we're not doing those things because some of those 
I think are valuable in what in what they offer harmonically and melodically and I'm very specific in which ones I choose because you know tune up for for is, is one of the examples I do tune up and it works really well because it's a lot of two five ones and when we get into the two five one unit around the second or third um, second second part of the spring semester or you know some wherever we get to it it's it leans itself really well because we're talking about upper extensions because the first melody note is the 11 so right. it, it's like okay how do we even begin to theoretically figure out what this is if that notes not even in the chord and then we have to just kind of brainstorm and we talk about extensions one three five seven nine eleven thirteen and then two five one motion and just getting and even boiling that down to just five one five one five one my great mentor um professor rennie napoleon he has this way of putting it he says um it's the cowboy principle and then he takes his guitar <laughs> and he does this <laughs> Five one five one five one, and then when it's minor, he calls it sad cowboy principle. <laughs> Can I tell you, man? You were touching on all these great things, and and that specifically is something I was just talking to a student about. Um, so it's cool to know that Randy is is on to this, or perhaps that I'm on to Randy. <laughs> but but man, yeah, you're just you're on all these different. Um, wavelengths right now and i'm loving it because it's all the stuff that is motivating this project of mine and and i want to i want to ask you about specifics but maybe we could backtrack a bit let me ask you first um how did you get this job <laughs> how did you arrive at, at michigan and and uh and you know who were some of the the forces let's say who who maybe pushed you in the, that direction Okay, so it's actually a pretty interwoven story, but I'll keep it concise. It's, it, it goes back to when I was in high school, and I was hanging around a lot. Um, you know, I had a connection with Osceola County School for the Arts in Orlando, or Kissimmee, Florida, and Ronnie Whitaker came to, to the school once to give like a a presentation or a master class just basically listen to our big band and give us some tips and it was like a really big deal and we we're like whoa so this is really cool this doesn't happen every day and they told us about a jazz summer camp going on <clears throat> dr phillips jazz intensive <coughs> excuse me and i was like that sounds really cool and it's really inexpensive they have some scholarships so i applied i got in and i got to spend some time there and professor napoleon was the guitar um, instructor and it was a very small guitar studio it was like three of us and and professor napoleon and it was really cool because it was very intimate and his teaching style is so on point the way that he is just so concise and he has a great way of imparting this information from guitarist to guitarist and from musician to musician no matter what instrument you play because he is just an incredible educator so i was really um excited when I started studying with him and he took a liking to me and noticed that I had some talent and he said you know if you want you know I know you're going to be going to college soon if you want to come to Michigan State that'd be a great option you should apply and I was like yeah that sounds really cool um you know because I didn't I wasn't sure what I was going to do I was really ex had my heart set on going to New York because I really wanted to be in the heart of what was happening in the jazz world and get my butt kicked really hard and have to like overcome it and grow through it so that was a big um, thing on my list that I wanted to obtain so I ended up applying to all of you know Manhattan School of Music Juilliard a um, couple Florida schools and then I think I put my hat in the ring in Michigan State and um, Napoleon really wanted me to go and I just I got accepted in the MSM and I said you know this has been in my heart for this long I'm not gonna now that it's Fit, I'm faced with it. I'm going to go for it. So I had just made that decision and he understood it was no hard feelings, but he still wanted me to go there. So I ended up um, getting through MSM, get to my senior year. And then, um, you know, Ronnie Jones was saying, if you if you're going to stay here because I'm going to be here, then don't stay here because I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to be staying at MSM after this year or, or for much longer because he's going to be 
moving forward from that into his own teaching thing, which now he's got jazz guitar scholars, which is incredible, doing the real work, getting people learning a lot of great stuff, um, as you know. And so he gave me that advice, and I was like, well, I don't want to do two more years of the same last four years that I just did. You know, if I'm going to do something, I want to broaden my experience. I want to get a different perspective about education, and I want to grow as an educator specifically. So, you know, I knew that they had the graduate assistantship. I had talked to a lot of people that had done it before, like um, Nathan Borton, great guitarist and educator, um, Jocelyn Gould. And, you know, they all had raving reviews about Michigan State and especially um, Randy and, you know, his his ability and as a teacher, you know, and, and a player. So I put my hat in the ring and did the whole audition. I visited and after visiting here, I felt the warmest welcome I'd ever felt. You know, I felt like I was already family. People trying to pick me up from the airport and being like, oh, just hang here. We'll just hang out at my place. And, you know, now I'm looking back and reminiscing and being like, why can't we have those sort of experiences now? It's such a bummer, but we we work through it. We're gonna get through it. Like, like this kind of thing. This is really nice to just be able to talk to you. Um, well. Yeah, so I was gonna say I got I got through the to the audition and then it was time to go and then that summer I toured and was able to do some stuff over in Poland and some other places and then now I'm back then I then I came back and started at Michigan State and then it was like boom now you have to get your syllabus together and now you have to you have these classes and it was just like you're in there and you, it's like baptism by fire almost which was. <laughs> good you know it's kind of like the new york way too <laughs> right right well you know so uh if i understand correctly does are you a graduate uh student assistant or is this are you just employed by the university okay so in One a graduate the assistantship the way it works specifically is that i get nine credit hours a semester I see. and i'm taking classes a bit, I have been for the last year and a half and I'm on the last semester right now of it at the same time I am employed by the um, by the school of Michigan State and they have me doing like nine hours of work nine to ten hours of work a week all accumulated um, between teaching private lessons teaching my my class twice a week and um, assisting with the studio class with Professor Napoleon and just other clerical work like writing out transcriptions or revising stuff, creating little um, spreadsheets and stuff for students, taking attendance, those sort of things. But all the all the aspects of the job really, which is cool because I'm doing a, I'm doing them all at the same time. So it is very taxing. It's a lot of work right. and a lot to juggle, especially with auditions and all these other things that I'm pursuing at the same time but you know make it work cool well listen man i i again you you've gone in so many directions in these answers and i have so many questions which is great i think uh as sort of a formality we could we could maybe say you've spent the last year now in that capacity right i've been asking everybody what what has 2020 and the beginning of 2021 looked like for you but but it sounds like that's what it's looked like for you in addition to your own shedding and you've been doing these live streams on your Facebook and on your Instagram, um, which maybe just to plug that for a second, how can people hear that stuff? Oh, okay. So yeah, my, my music page is James Zito Music on Facebook. You can find me like the page and that's where I always post my live streams. I try to share them through that. And my personal page, just James Zito on Facebook and James Zito 3, the number 3, on Instagram. And my website is going to be up in the next few days, and then we'll have that together. Oh, great. And then I will share that on all those different services. So. Oh, excellent, excellent. That's, that's great. And uh, I guess I would, would also ask on the subject of – I know we're jumping around here, but, but this is because you've offered so much content um, – on the subject of emotion in these recordings that you've studied, these great masters that you've studied, how have those things um, affected your own music, whether as a composer or a player, right? An improviser. Wow, I'm so glad you asked me that question because um, specifically when I go to compose, I don't ever really start 
with anything other than an emotion or a feeling or I find a subject first to inspire my melodies and I try to look um, within myself when I and and contemplate you know if I if I ma if I imagine a picture of like a flower being like wilting away and it's a dark background and it's like it kind of has this ominous feeling that's going to sound completely different to me than a bouquet of flowers in the middle of an art museum or even one single sunflower on my windowsill that's those three things all all have flowers to do with them but they are in different settings and they offer different emotions and ranges of expression and i i honestly i just hit record and i think about the feelings that i've and i try to channel these emotions and feelings that i've experienced in my life or i try to put myself in the shoes of someone else when i'm trying to write for that purpose you know if i'm trying to pay homage to whoever's compositional style i think about their life i think about where they're coming from and i listen to their recordings and i try to embody that sound through this new composition whatever it is i just wrote a song recently called when you open up your heart and what happened is i was thinking about unity through music and our connection that is so primal and something that is really um it's like it goes so far back even to like the womb when you're in the womb of your mother and you have you hear you can feel the heartbeat and you can hear it it's something that you don't remember but it's something that is instinctual that happened for sure that you didn't even know you were feeling the rhythm of life and what it feel what it's going to feel like to be alive because you're growing just as we're growing as musicians and I think it's really deep because we're connected in such a deep manner through rhythm and um, harmony and melody and the way that we can sing together as a community and like be have such a strong presence and have such a connectivity through um, through a united medium of music and whatever whatever way you want to do it and so I wrote this song, When You Open Up Your Heart, because I want to um, encourage people and challenge them to be open to um, things that confuse them or that they don't understand and try to learn about other people and other cultures so that we can come together as, you know, a harmonious musical community and community of just people that are trying to navigate the same uh, struggles. Man, that's amazing. And I'm hearing a lot of uh, Rodney Jones. <laughs> so this might be, at this juncture, it might be a good time to, to ask you, who is Rodney Jones? Wow, that's a, that's a, it's gonna be a mouthful because Rodney Jones is, for me, encompasses the deepest level of expression and love and um, wisdom and honesty when when i think of ronnie jones i think of somebody that truly cares about me and everyone that he comes in contact with because he's so thoughtful in his language and the way he relates situations to you and it's and it's almost never the same because he always is so personal with each student he's he's trying to impart wisdom and knowledge to because he builds a connection with, with his students he gets to understand you know where they're coming from and why they're playing music he has this great phrase you know find your why and I have that on my Instagram because that really stuck with me and I've thought about this and it took me you know a year and a half or more since I started this assistantship to be like what is my why like I know what it is but I can't articulate it I can't I couldn't show you anything reminiscent of it. I couldn't like point and be like, it's something like this. It's like, I, but in my heart, it was there. It's just, I couldn't pull it out, but he really challenged me to figure that out for myself and try to put it into words and also try to bring it out through my music. Because I think that as an art, as artists, we have to connect our compositions and our music with, you know, who we, See how we see ourselves and how we want to um, affect the world like how we can um, have this like s sort of unified voice compositionally and improvisationally that we can draw upon and that's why when you hear people like Kurt Rosenwinkel and when you hear people like Rodney Jones there's this so there's this like clear sound like that is that person like when you hear John Coltrane 
wow, that's John Coltrane. You, there's no mistake because he is completely aligned in his ideology and the way he perceives the world and what he's trying to do. And you can really see that in like the 60s going forward with Train, like such a clear, defined, I know what I'm doing. I'm going for something. Now, it's, it's coming into fruition. I'm going to find this thing and it's going to be incredible. But no, nothing is going to stop me, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So when I think of Ronnie Jones, it's like all the embodiment of the spirituality of John Coltrane, all the wisdom and speaking ability and like and preaching ability like Martin Luther King. I think of um, the highest level of guitar playing like George Benson and and beyond. And then I think of the chordal exploration of um mccoy tyner i think of herbie hancock's limitless creativity all those things for me encompass rodney jones uh i couldn't agree more and and i think arguably the most important thing you said was his uh personal connection with with each student and again this is another lesson that i've had to um you know still work on right i'm not sure that i totally have that with my students but but it's really remarkable, and I can tell you that, um, you know, I, I used to go into lessons with him, and, and he'd say, man, you've got your own thing going. You'll never have technique like James Zito. <laughs> and I'm like, that's true. But he, but he said, you know, and then actually one of our last lessons, I think my last lesson, you you sat in on that lesson, and, and it was like a three-guitar hang. and And that speaks to... The fact that he is interested in each person that he comes into contact with and this is probably as as good a time to announce as ever that he will be on this show uh after you we've got jenny shu our our dear friend but but after her it'll be rodney so so i'm gonna talk to him about just those things you bring up but but i'm glad you mentioned him because and i'll, I'll relate a story about you now just briefly um you know I had these lessons with him and and uh you know you mentioned how he he pulled things out of you right that you didn't maybe even know were in you right and uh my my father told me once that he felt that rodney lit a fire under me and i think that's true but i think you were part of the um impetus for that you know i, I remember being in a practice room once and you came in, you've heard me tell this story before, but, but it's worth sharing here. Uh, you came in and man, let's play some duo. Cool. And we're, we must've played one tune, two tunes. It wasn't a lot. And, and you were playing unplugged. We were both playing unplugged. Uh, but your level of projection and sound, um, was so impressive to me. That I'm like, okay, this is this is what Rodney's talking about. I remember Rodney had a long conversation with me about, you know, man, you're playing a Gibson, like make it make it sound like a Gibson, <laughs> and and he was right, man, and and it was it you were kind of the key that unlocked that lesson from Rodney through you. So I want to commend you for that and for and for owning those things, um, and and perhaps the non guitarists watching this will will pardon that that geek out moment but 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 really i think that's great stuff and i appreciate you speaking about him because obviously he's been so important to both of us um but to recap right you're at msm you're at michigan state you're writing you're teaching you're shedding you're live streaming you're working on all these different things um you mentioned concept you mentioned my concept, but I think our concepts are not totally dissimilar. Um, maybe one leans in one direction more than another. I'm not sure. Perhaps you can speak to that. But but more importantly, I'd like to ask you, how would you describe your own concept or sum it up? If I had to try to put my concept into words, I would have to say, hmm, that's a really difficult thing to just put into words you know if i've just had to talk from a from a music from a musical perspective i'm really trying to push some of the boundaries of the guitar i want to see what's possible in a trio setting and that includes a lot of density and chordal harmony and um exploring the fourths and fifths 
sounds and parallels parallelism within that and like creating melodies based off of um, these really dense chordal um, concepts like uh, I wrote a tune minor lies and it's it's um it kind of ex it goes to a very extreme extents first of all it's overly burning like you know to almost three basically 300 almost <laughs> at sometimes depends on where I call it and um, at the same time the line really utilizes the right hand technique of Rodney Jones and you know the also the George Benson style of holding the pick in the specific angle and there's a couple of different ways you can play this song and I, I choose to utilize this technique because I, I use it as a tool to build that and um, that's a really difficult thing as a guitarist just to do really clean and seamlessly especially at that tempo and then still be burning and exploring all the different textures um, so I think texturally I'm trying to um, you know push myself and the limits of what is possible not necessarily possible because you know the, the baddest of the bad can do whatever is possible but what I, is possible for me and see you know how I can break through that and find you know my my personal voice through um, through those concepts additionally I'm trying to um, widen the pers the the emotional range that I can bring through my my composition and music I'm trying to um, take a lot of influence from Wayne Shorter's compositional style and um, implement that stuff into my music. I've been on a huge Charlie Parker fad and Delonis Monk fad where I'm like trying to deep, get deeper into their compositions and allow that to influence my style. <clears throat> so I'm still really in the kind of in the thick of putting it together right now and I think that I'm really close to breaking through. Right now I'm working on a series of compositions for my first project as a leader. So I'm trying to get out within the next year or so you know hopefully everything goes well and as plans seeing where life takes me into the next <laughs> uh, after this next semester but yeah that's kind of where I'm at musically I'm just trying to explore the limits of the guitar from a solo guitar standpoint as well as um, in my trio you know man uh, that's great and I'm glad I asked you because earlier when you were talking about um, composing I heard a lot of abstract, um, conceptual, let's say philosophical, uh, uh, waxing poetic, right? And and the fact of the matter is, you have all that for sure. But I wanted to touch on the fact that you you are ripping on the guitar too, man. And and it's not just me saying that. It's obviously Rodney Jones, probably Randy Napoleon, right? And every guitar player I've talked to who knows you, if it's Gareth Fowler, who we're gonna have. Jan Knudsen, right? All these guys, uh, man, Zito, he's, he's even David Rosenthal, right? All these guys, Zito's doing it, man. Uh, so I'm glad you, you were honest about that and not, uh, <laughs> not trying to tone it down. Cause you've got it, man. And, and, and since you're a guitar player and, and since you're the first guitar player on this show, hopefully people will pardon me if we talk some shop for a second, you've got a beautiful piece of machinery behind you there. Uh, could you talk about that and how you uh, acquired it and, and some of the specs on it? Oh, you're still on mute there, James. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so this no is the Benedetto Bambino Deluxe. It's an incredible instrument. It's the finest guitar I've ever had the honor and privilege of owning. Um, so the way I was able to get in a position to view this guitar and you know uh, ultimately purchase it and become a Benedetto artist was I you know all my teachers throughout since high school all the way up till here in graduate school have all played a Benedetto and I've, oh, it's always just been around me and I've always been like yeah that's the dream yeah but I've always just ended up buying like the Angelicos and I have my Ibanez you know GB 40 incredible guitars as well but um, this guitar is just a whole nother level of craftsmanship and artistry. You know, um, Ronnie Jones actually has the same model with different inlays, though. He's got the blocks. Um, but, you know, I went to the, to the factory in, in Georgia, and I got to visit um, Howard Paul, 
and he was very kind to me but a great gentleman and Ronnie Ronnie had told me you know yeah you should go out there and meet them and see the factory and you know give me a call when you get there basically and I was like cool I got you I'll do that and I'm with Howard and we're in the room looking and they have this one guitar that's just um, somebody was gonna buy but it was taking too long and they said okay just give me one that's further along I'll buy a different model I don't care I just need a guitar I'm like okay fine so then this one is sitting there half done like the next not even not like done yet the headstock's not done but the body looks fantastic and I'm like oh man because yeah, normally on a waiting list like once you buy the guitar it's like okay now I gotta wait eight months maybe if it's from scratch because they're literally building this up and they have so many dried woods and aged things from overseas and it's like it's like super high quality and it takes a lot of time and there's a lot of steps in the process so after seeing all this I talked with Howard um, I call Rodney and Rodney says on FaceTime call with Howard he's like man you need to you need to get James on your radar. He's like one of the he's gonna be one of the next great guitarists. And and after he said something like like along those lines to um to Howard, he's Howard's eyebrows went. I was like, oh, he doesn't really just say that about anybody. So he was re highly impressed. And then we go into the office to try out you know a demo model of this guitar. And I play, and <clears throat> he's like, thank God you sound like. Rodney Jones and, and he said a couple other names but he was just like thank god you were basically rooted in the blues and have like a huge projection on the guitar as opposed to playing in a little different style and he was really he just liked it and he was happy and then we were talking about pricing and I was like um, you know do you guys have any discounts for students or anything like that and then he says um, you know we have this artist endorsement program where you'll technically be a, a, ben, a Benedetto artist slash educator since I'm teaching and um, uh, you know you get a certain price reduction and you're basically in the club which was like I was just like oh my gosh this was like an aha moment like oh my goodness my dad was with me which was really cool because he was super excited about the whole process and learning he was like googly eyed over all the different like uh, various woods because he's a ha he's a handyman a contractor he knows about all that kind of stuff so he was really just seeing the process and the tools was fun for him and he knows my affliction for the guitar and he's always been a huge supporter so he was basically he championed me all the way up to this point you know when I started at seven years old he's the one who bought me my first you know quarter sized um, first act jet, um, guitar. It had a button and a circle in the center for an amplifier. This thing was like literally like this big from here to there. <laughs> and it's tiny and you know he bought it for me and he's always invested in my in my music and he had a lot of trust and faith in me because I've shown that I really care about this and this is something that I want to pursue for my whole life. Like I couldn't imagine waking up and not playing music. So to be able to do it on such an incredible instrument like the Benedetto Bambino Deluxe with my name on it. Zito the Third, man. What, what much better can you get than that? It's really that, that's the coolest, unreal. man. <laughs> that's really so, that's awesome. And and you know it's well deserved. And and uh, oh no, don't put it down. <laughs> You're hanging on to that for a second, man. But but uh, it's really well well earned, man. And and I think uh, it is a beautiful instrument. And uh, I love those inlays. Um, Thank you. Is the, yeah. is the pickup? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say about the inlays. It started off because they had it done to the point where this inlay was there. And I was like, oh, I kind of want to have different than just the, the stock thing. So they're like, this is what we can do. We have this type of inlay, and we'll just do it and keep this here. Normally, this type of inlay doesn't actually have the double on the 12. Wow. Supposedly. I think it normally just has one in the center or one down here. But they did this really slick thing. So I love the way it ended up looking because I think it's really nice and symmetrical and beautiful. It's sleek, man. And and, uh, and you told me recently you're using 12s on that? Yeah, I just put um, t um, 12s on. I, I really love the Benedetto strings. I haven't got a chance to order um, some a new pack of those. So I just put on some... I think it was XLs or something. Yeah. But right now they're working fine. I put 12 flat wounds on. I've been. This is my first time going back to flat wounds for like a year. For the last year, um, Randy Napoleon has got me on round wounds as far as because we've been exploring really? the um, 
yeah, the ability to get tone in the lower register and like really getting the resonance out of those um, round wounds. And it's, it's actually, it makes a big difference, but I, I went back to the flats and I, there's so many things I love about the flats because with the, with the rounds, sometimes you get that squeaky noise and that part of it's not fun, but, but right now I got flats, so. The, yeah, the I flats cool. are home for sure. <laughs> Man, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. And, and, uh, the pickup is the pickup just stock Benedetto. Do you know? Yeah, I just went. I stuck with the stock one. They have a, a upgraded version. It's like I can't remember exactly what it's called. It's like all black though. But I really dug the the gold hardware here because I think it added nice continuity. So oh, it's beautiful. And the the sound for me was is really great. So I've just been totally happy with it. Um, what about picks? What kind of picks do you use? Fender medium all the way every day. <laughs> That's greatest so range of expression, greatest greatest um, control over soft and loud. With a soft pick, you can't get loud. If it's soft, how loud are you really going to get if it's going the whole time? On a hard pick, it's difficult to get soft. It takes a lot more control when you've got something really hard. Personally, that's what I've experienced. With the medium pick, when I want to play soft, I can play really soft, you know? And if I want to play loud, I can play loud. And I can I can explore that loud and soft relationship throughout my lines. Like I don't the whole line doesn't have to feel like it's loud. The whole line doesn't have to feel like it's soft. I want it to go like this. I want it to feel like it's breathing when I play, so like... You know, whatever it's gonna be, but... Just all that control and articulation is really important to me. So, I choose Fender Mediums because I, I've found that I can really, and this also speaks to more of Rodney Jones because he's the one who told me this stuff. So it's not like I'm saying this. He said this and told me, so I'm just telling it to you. <laughs> Man, you and, and Rodney. And I personally believe 100% because it shows like I can oh, yeah. have that control. You might sell me on the Fender Medium. Right now I'm using these these uh, Dunlop XLs. I don't know if you can see that. They're, they're like a almost see-through gold color. And uh, they're, I think they're about the same size, but the material might be different. Um, but yeah, I haven't played a Fender Medium in probably 10 years, so I'm gonna have to <laughs> try that again. But yeah, man, this is great. Okay, and, and, and before we close, man, I just have a, a couple more uh, questions if we could uh, get to those. First of yeah. all, if you were you know, a college grad, during COVID, or a high schooler during COVID. Any words of wisdom as to what you would do with your time? Find a way to build community and to, <clears throat> at the same time, work on a skill that you really want to flourish in. Whether it's a strength that you want to make stronger or a weakness that you want to bring up the par with the rest of your um, musicianship or just livelihood, whatever it is, pursue it and go all the way with it. And at the end, you're going to look back and say, I did this and I committed to it. And now I'm standing further forward, closer to where I want to be than I was when I started. That's the goal. Whether, you know, if you make 5%, even if you make 2% progress every single week, by the end of the year, you're getting a lot closer to your goal. You basically, you'll, you'll get to your goal at that point, 52 weeks so you know just thinking about <clears throat> time management and trying to create like you're doing a creative project this sort of thing you're building community you're, you're allowing giving people something to watch gain perspective to learn you're learning I'm learning and we both get to you know get into a, a setting where we're um, articulating what, how we're feeling and other people can bounce off those emotions and now there's a dialogue and something's starting. You've ignited a fire by doing this. So exactly what you're doing and then apply that to whatever medium you want it to be. 
whether it's interviewing or if it's collaborating with other musicians or if it's writing a composition or writing a book or whatever you know even if it's cooking doing a cooking zoom and talking with the greatest chefs <laughs> you know like we're all gonna benefit from that and it's gonna help us through these times as we all so very need is like something to push us through and inspire us and give us you know just that little push in a more in a brighter direction awesome answer awesome answer man and and uh one last question and that is professor uh any i'm not set up to play but any exercises you could show to any instrument just general how to be a jazz improviser lesson so you want um specifically like a little exercise that i would say to do or a tip or or a perspective on it oh, okay on any so, aspect of music. especially if you're just starting out as an improviser uh, something i notice a lot and that I've this happened to me as well and still happens sometimes you know nerves get to us when we're holding our instrument They're, when we're trying to get a beautiful big fat sound it takes a lot of control and it takes a lot of um, just being relaxed and I think that's a re something that a lot of people struggle with especially when they're faced with an audience and having to improvise something that they've never technically never played before that they're trying to come up with the way I try to get my students to overcome this is to take something that you know you're gonna play you, like you you have a phrase that you're working out and you like I know that this is, sounds good and I like how it sounds personally whoever whatever that is for you and you find a way to apply it let's say over a blues and you just practice playing that same phrase over and over um, with conviction and the same way Grant Green plays every single phrase with conviction and total control and rela relaxation you're you need to focus your 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 mind to think I know this phrase works I'm confident in this this is what this phrase sounds like confident I know that and you record yourself and you listen back and you you um, listen to the differences of the first time you played it and the 30th time and you say you know and I and I challenge you to explore with that one line and see like really squeeze out all the juice that you can get from it find different ways of articulating it find different ways of phrasing it play it at different tempos feel the difference of like this is all the same musical phrase but I need to approach it differently at different tempos and in different settings like if I'm playing in with the composer sit, sitting right in front of me now I'm stressed you know or whatever it is getting past that point is 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 a struggle that you know you can overcome first of all but you have to be patient with yourself and not cast judgment over yourself either because we all deal with this it's just it's human and you need to sit with that and 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 basically just challenge yourself to work through those in your own practice time as a as a way to you know um internalize your language or or your whatever stuff you're playing and find ways of doing it confidently and controlled and relaxed amazing man that you know this has been i i can say hopefully without uh insulting anyone else that this this might have been my favorite interview so far man you, you and it's not just because you're a guitarist i i think you've offered some some uh you know advice and and some wisdom that is applicable in many different contexts you know, across many different disciplines, whether it's the education side, the composition side, the performance side, etc. I, I think you really have um, some some great insight, man. And I just can't thank you enough for for being here. It's been very cool. Um, and, you know, with all that said, could I could I uh, entice you to play us out with something, whether it's a standard or an original or some. Piece? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much again for having me and for everyone for listening. You know, your support goes, everyone's support goes such a long way. And even you having me here means so much to me. And I'm just so grateful and thankful. I would be happy to play you out. I'm just going to do a blues. I'm just going to keep it real nice. and give That's us some what blues. Talking about. Hell yeah. My mic on my amp doesn't seem to be working, but ho I think it'll be okay if I just put the mic back a little bit. Does that sound okay? Beautiful, man. Okay.
my man. James Zito, everybody. You're making me smile with that stuff, man. That's great. Thank you. Man, thank you. This this has been a screw the script interview, and I, as a jazz musician, that like makes me so happy. <laughs> I can't thank you enough for that, man. And 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 really, you, you're always welcome back. If you have a record out or something, you want to talk, I, I would be happy to do this again. But, uh, man, th thank you, and thank you everybody for watching. Like I said, we're gonna have uh, my dear friend Jenny Shu, the pianist, uh, next week, and then. Rodney after that so stay tuned these videos will always be free but if you support and believe in this content you're you're more than welcome to make a donation the relevant links are below so thank you very much everybody and we'll see you next time bye bye <laughs>